Um, for those of you who weren't in Josh's session, Josh did a fabulous session um, just before lunch about the South China Morning Post, and he's, I'm coming from the editorial perspective, um, and Josh was coming from the technical perspective, and hopefully we'll be able to um, do a cross discussion together. Um, so first, a little bit about me. Hi, um, my name's Roseanne Burston. Um, I've been in content strategy since about 1994, believe it or not. When Kate Lundy this morning said that she's been um, angling for an MBN since about 94, I was like, yeah, I remember that. And I wrote an article about you in 1995 when I was the editor of internet.au. <laughs> so that's how long I've been doing this. And I started life as a journalist. I was the founding editor of internet.au. I was the web producer for Choice magazine in 1998. Um, I've worked as a digital strategist with Fairfax, the city of Melbourne, the University of Melbourne, with Greenpeace, with uh, News Limited and most recently with Sydney Tape. I'm relatively platform agnostic. I've worked with Drupal. I've worked with WordPress. I've worked with SharePoint, God help me. <coughs> I've worked with My Source Matrix. I've worked with all sorts of crazy CMSs. Um, what I know from all of these is that the content strategy and the editorial strategy and the editorial workflow is one of those things that you need to work out before you start building your site. And you need to know how technical and how aware your content team is to know how they're going to work with what you've built. So I'm now heading my own startup, um, doing content and digital strategy. And one of the things I do is I work with agencies to help build whatever it is the organization I'm working with wants to do. Um, I know some of you have commented on my Chief Mischief Maker title and um, that's kind of how I'm seeing myself is trying to take the wonderful things that we can do and, and make some mischief, not do the same old boring stuff that we've been doing forever, but do something interesting and exciting. Um, I like to disrupt expectations. Um, when we talk about content strategy, I want to acknowledge that uh, Angus Gordon's talk was a fantastic um, beginning to talking about content strategy. And one of the things that he mentioned was about how it's partly about your production flow. And that's my first slide, so hopefully this is a good continuation. In some ways, content strategy is that thing you do at the very beginning of the process where you say, how is this site going to look? What components do I have? What variables, will what taxonomies? How do these things all talk to each other? Where should I put this thing if I have a website that is about, uh, you know, cars and it, the car reviews are what are on my website or tests of fridges. What aspects of a car are there? Are there models? Are there makes? Are there colours? How do I put that on the site? That's part of your content strategy. What I want to do is talk about what it looks like for the content producer the day that they first put in a car into the system, how they're going to choose these things and where it goes. Um, those of you who are in media companies will probably recognize this kind of crazy production workflow as one of the things that you do just about every day. You know, it's this thing where you're starting with story development and actually I'm not sure it's actually as visible as it could be on this slide, sorry about that. And then you're going into production and you're writing and then you're moving into copy editing and then you publish it, but publishing it's not the end of the story because you've got to then grow the story with social media and then it all comes back down to, you know, this kind of story collation and story generation again and, and round it goes. So it's very complex as a system. And I've got a um, credit. This is for, from Amy Webb, um, the Web Media Group. Does this look familiar to anyone? No? You've, you've, some of you are nodding. The primary question for an editorial content team is how do we make this coherent, and efficient. How do we talk about our production strategy, our content strategy, so that we are consistently delivering the best quality content we possibly can using the content management system that the dev teams worked so hard to build for us? The worst thing that I see often is this fabulous site that's delivered, and then about a month after it's delivered, half of the features aren't being used because the content team doesn't know how to use them. They don't understand how to use them. They've forgotten how to use them. 
or they kind of never really asked for that. They wanted something different and it never quite was delivered the way that they expected. So they're just going to shoehorn what they thought they were going to do into some other component of the site instead. And it ends up looking like a dog's breakfast. Does that sound familiar to the devs in the room? Yeah. OK. So the question is, how do we make this work properly? Um, I've been talking with a couple of other people as well about how in some CMSs, um, you end up with this fabulous site furniture around the edges that brings you consistency. But that the middle of the site is just a bucket that you keep the content into. And of course, that means the content's not reusable because it's just a bucket. You're copying and pasting. And it's not consistent because it's just a bucket. And so right at that very beginning where you're having that strategy discussion with the editorial team is when you want to be talking about what has to be on every single one of these articles. And it's not just a title and a blurb and a short title and the kicker that appears on the front page that's separate from the lead that's in bold, that's separate from something else and one image and the related content and all those other things. You know, there's obviously there's the meta information as well, but if you've got video that's only on some stories, you don't want that to be an embed code that someone's just slammed in somewhere. You want to have a video component that can be dragged in in the right place by someone who knows what they're doing. Um, now, as I said, I'm not a developer. I'm, all, I'm tempted to throw over to, to Josh to jump in here because from my point of view, the ideal is if your production flow is managed within your content management system. I've heard a lot of people talking this weekend about, this week, about um, emails that get flicked to people in queues um, to tell you that there's something ready for you to do. I'd prefer not to be switching in and out of my CMS to know what I'm supposed to do. And one of the things I've seen work pretty well is Workbench, um, which is a, a suite of modules that has um, Workbench access and Workbench node queue and Workbench moderation that allows you as an editor to uh, take the different levels that people have and move them through, move an article through, and you can log into your Workbench. And again, sorry about the resolution of the image, um, at the top there it says content I've edited and it tells that person who, which articles they're, they're working on right now and what materials available for them to work on in Drupal and they can see, you, can, you as an editor can log in and see who's working on what in what way and moderate the articles as it goes through. Um, and <coughs> I've you know, got to tip my hat over here to, to David who yesterday showed me some new things as well um, with Panoply and uh, with the inline editing with um, Spark, is it? Which is fantastic. You know, from now on, I'm recommending those to anyone who's trying to do a, a, con a site for content editors because it instantly makes it so much easier um, for those content editors to see what they're doing and, and edit the right sections of the page and not get confused about what they're doing and thinking, oh, well, I don't know where it goes. I don't know what's going on. I haven't gotten to that point in the form, so I'll just stick it up here where it doesn't belong. Um, so, um, I think this, I put some of this in because I didn't know who I was going to be talking to. I think that you all know about creating, you know, content people with the right levels of permissions and about not having nodes published immediately. I don't think I need to say that. What some of you won't know is about what the newsrooms of the future are looking like. Now, I worked for News Limited as a digital operations manager. Um, from 2011 to 2012. I had 170 journalists, photographers, and editors working with us uh, on 23 sites. So I was working for News Local, which is the uh, local newspapers. Um, I imagine a number of you are aware of Inner West Courier, North Shore Times, Blacktown Advocate, um, Wentworth Courier, all of those are part of that family. And one of the things that News Limited and Fairfax and just about everyone else I know of are working toward is a design similar to this, which comes from an uh, inno innovation company in the, I think they're based in Spain actually. Um, and this central desk is called the super desk. And the idea of the super desk is that the editor in chief and the picture editor and all of the key editorial people now sit in the center of the room. And around those chiefs now sit 
the print team, the social team, the editorial teams, the image graphics team. And then on the very edges, you've got the TV screens and the video screens and the broadcast and the social media monitoring spaces. Now, not all of you are going to be working with enormous companies, but even if you've only got five staff, I think this is one of the ways you want to start to set yourselves up so that you can scale when you get there. Um, and those chiefs, can, you can optimise the inputs and outputs uh, of your content. You're also dealing in the, in the newsroom of the future with the 24-hour news space, and you all know this, you're all familiar with this. But what you may not know is that even the news limiteds of the world are now all talking about digital first. There is no such thing anymore as a print journalist. There is just a journalist. There is no such thing anymore as a morning and afternoon paper, really. Everything just goes online, and then it gets collated and pulled out into print. Um, is that clear? Not from them. So let's switch over here. Uh, yeah, is there a second? Is there? There's yeah. a second mic over there. Oh, I think. oh really? Oh, I'm gonna. No. Oh. It does. Okay, cool. Um, so just a, a, a quick comment on that, um, with how it was how we worked in Asia. Um, they actually were sort of teaching that you need to separately. This way, okay. Um, so yeah, you need to look at media. Each uh, medium that you put your media to as different targets uh, operate for different things. So, for example, paper always goes out in the morning, uh, and uh, internet goes out day at different points. This is going in and out, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and so, if they looked at a story, for example. Um, I think it was, I'll keep going this way just in case it right. makes things better. Uh, perhaps you might want to turn your one off. Talk, see if that helps at all. Uh, so, uh, to get an event, I think the, the, the example they showed was, uh, it was an Asian country, sorry, I can't remember what it was, say it was Taiwan, won a, 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 an event to be able to host it in their country. And the whole country was really happy about it. That decision was made at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So when that happened, it was on TV, it got put up in social media, everyone was really happy about it. The news companies at the time should have pushed everything to their online platforms at that time. Uh, and then the next day, the paper came out and it was still pushing that same message. But in reality, at that stage, people had already gotten over the fact that it had happened. They'd already done their celebration with their workmates at, you know, from two to three, four, five. And come the morning, they're ready for the next exit of news. So instead, you need to look at what, uh, target the news, and because it is a current event, and the term current has just changed from being once a day to all the time. And so instead, the paper now needs to be planned to be pushing out something that preempts what's going to happen the day ahead. Don't look back on what happened yesterday. So I think that's just the yeah. one point I had. There's a question? Um, I'm, I'm print and uh, news media is the first time I've been involved in this industry. I'm more of a dev guy, software guy. So but I'm working with a client who um, primarily print, um, but they recognize that you know they need to be online. So they do have a website. It's kind of crappy, so, so we're implementing Drupal, right? Um, but one of the problems they are facing is um, internal struggles between the print editorial team and the web editorial team. And I'll add to it, they even have a mobile editorial team, and they each publish different types of content, often of the same title. And uh, one of the things I, I'd like to ask you, based on that point, is that one of the strategies uh, this company is thinking of, I'm not sure you know, where they're gonna end up with, but um, because online is 24 hours, and once the news hit the floor, it goes online. So, and you know, by the time the print comes out, it's old news. So they're trying to change a strategy so that the news that gets printed is more in depth and provide a different type of content that's satisfy those people who still enjoy having a print uh, medium. And then they also have a weekly publication where it goes really in depth. Absolutely, absolutely. This is where you on again. Yeah, it's just angled wrong. Right, here we go. Um, 
and that's not going to... Oh, well. Um, I would say that that's um, absolutely absolutely the case. It's sort of one of the things that happened with every single level of media. That's as you, When radio came out, that changed the way magazines were read, and when TV came out, it changed the way you had to use radio, and, you know, the internet came out, it's changed the way you have to use the previous media. And absolutely, you know, you start to see more analytical pieces in print because you've got that longer time, and the, the breaking news is now the web, so you don't see the breaking news story with the big announcement anymore. You've got the more in-depth analytical piece in the print. But the other thing that, um, that what you, your questions made me think of is that um, with News Limited, with what one of the things that they've done now is they've got a, a news team that's doing kind of 80% of the work for everything, and then the other 20% is being pulled in from the other places. So um, the, Austra you know, the Australian and the Daily Telegraph side and the news.com side and all of those other things and the iPad side, etc. there's kind of this 80% that's common and then the 20% that's being done by the other teams to localise or sp uh, specialise so that that material is relevant for that audience. So if there's a, a mobile content, it's going to be more tightly designed for the mobile space. And then if you've got your local paper, then it's more coordinated for your local area. But the, you, know, you can scale up or scale down pretty quickly. Okay. Um, I also, um, when I was at Choice Magazine, we had the same problem with moving on to web. There used to be a, um, a two-month cycle between testing and print, and um, we were trying to, we had a big change process to get the testers to put their data straight into the database that went straight onto online, and then have the print product come out afterwards with the summary of the best products. And that was a huge process, and that was sort of you know an ongoing thing in 1998 even. Yeah. Sorry. What is best? Oh, with with Choice Magazine, it's it's like um it's like Consumer Reports or Which Online or um, Consumers and Bond. It's so they when they say best, I mean at that time they were doing a bar barrage of tests, um, for whatever it was, and one of the things about online which was interesting is that people want to rate their own stuff and say, well, this is, budget's more important to me, this is more important to me, and that's one of the reasons why it needed to go online first, because the print product sort of comes out with, well, this is the top one according to the editors, but online people want to be able to rate their own stuff. But that's separate. So um, I don't want to, <coughs> I'm going to run pretty quickly through the content stuff that I want to talk about so we can get on to some of the paywall stuff, because obviously that's also important. Um, so, I'm going to take you through an example um, news story. Um, there's no one production flow, but once you've got your production flow, you want that to be the same for every single story that you produce, um, except for the breaking news. Because obviously, if there is something absolutely massive and major that's just happened, like, you know, some famous figure has just killed themselves, or um, for me at News Limited, the example was. Um, the guy strapping a bomb to his 11-year-old daughter, I think it was, last year. Um, you need to be able to rush through very quickly um, and get to a manager who knows both the editorial and the legal and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm just... Um, no, it's all right. I'm just switching it around so it doesn't keep flipping. It's just held wrong. Oh, is that the problem? No worries. Sorry. <laughs> um, I don't want to stand in front of the... Can everyone still see that? That's why I'm standing to the side. Um, so, um, you, so you've got, you've got your basic editorial flow and then you've got your fast-track editorial flow. And since that's something that needs to happen in the, in the editorial room, your technical system needs to be able to cope with that as well. You need some way of flagging this is a, a breaking news story or a fast track story and so it's allowed to skip through some of the production steps because the one person is going to be checking it and they're going to be bored stiff with having to go through the three steps that normally have to be gone through instead of the one when they're trying to get something out before the competitor. Um, so I'm going to start with the beginning of a story. Traditionally um, what happened with print stories is that interactive was thought of last and putting it on the web was thought of last and so there was never any time 
to deliver <laughs> the really cool stuff that you wanted to do. Um, and uh, I can't tell you how many times I've dealt with stories where they, it's in print and they come to me after that's been printed and they say, hey, we've been talking about this and we think that we could do this thing. And it's like, well, now you've got half an hour. That we can't. There's no way the devs can do what you're talking about in half an hour. Whereas if they'd pitched that at the same time as they pitched the story, the devs could have been working on it while they were doing the research and it could all be delivered at once. So I want to take you through an example where one of our journalists, Tyrone Butson, had all of the coordinates of all of the fracking sites in Sydney. So um, for those of you who don't know the word fracking, we're talking about coal steam gas drills. Um, and he had been doing what he's supposed to do. He'd been monitoring the social media and he'd seen that there were protest groups out there very upset about coal seam gas. And so he had gathered all of the geo coordinates into a spreadsheet. He went, took it to the news producer. The news producer says, yep, great idea. What do you want to do with it? He says, I think an interactive map. Great. So it comes to me as the digital manager and I bring in devs and together as, an, as a combination, as a cross-functional production team, we have discussions about this data. What are the dimensions of the data? How, what can we do to that data to reveal more information about it? Um, is it, can we size or color code something to make something more obvious about it? Um, and in the end, we talked about the depth of the wells and whether it's a production well or an, ex or an expansion well and all those sorts of things. You also talk about what tools you're gonna use and the devs can go away. Now, what happens? How does everyone know what they're supposed to do? The editor, hopefully, is going to write a, a brief summarising that meeting so that everyone in the team, the journalist, the editors, the production, the devs, know what's been agreed and can deliver and know what the deadline is. My, you know, hopefully we're talking in the same levels here. Now, um, how does everyone know that? Um, one of the ways of doing it is attaching a note somewhere as a block that has certain permissions so that only you can see it um, and, or only the right people can see it and then you've got the brief in the system with the article. Why is the article there? Because the production editor creates an empty shell of the article even though the content hasn't been written yet. So it's already in workbench, it's already on its way through the system. Um, I'm not going to concentrate on this too much because um, from the sounds of it, the people who are here from content already do media and the people who aren't here from content are devs not working on blogs. But don't let the speed of the cycle get in the way of facts and uh, ethics. And it doesn't just happen to small companies. Um, NPR and Reuters got caught by the fact that uh, this guy calling himself comfortably smug was um, putting out false information about Hurricane Sandy, about uh, power outages and mayors being trapped and things like that. Turns out he was a Republican aide. <laughs> okay, but NPR and Reuters both retweeted him because they thought they didn't have time to check. It's always important to check. My other favourite is uh, photographs. Um, the top one is actually from uh, the day after tomorrow, the 2004 movie. And as you can see, someone's photographed it, uh, photoshopped it to add a news strap to make it look more obvious and more real. Um, and the bottom one's harder to pick. It actually is a real storm, but it happened in April 2011. So it's not Hurricane Sandy. So just a note, to any of you who were at Tim Berners-Lee on Tuesday night will have heard this as well. We've got to stop concentrating on the death of print media and remember that we're still in the business of producing quality journalism. Right? Doesn't matter what format it's out there in. Um, thankfully, no media organisations that I know of were fooled by the photoshopped images of sharks in people's backyards. <laughs> um, okay, so now we're up to story delivery. So the deadline's there, all the content's entered into Drupal, the writer is adding the links and images in our content process. In your content process, you might have someone else doing the images. You might have someone else doing the metadata. Um, the way that News Limited's working at the moment is that there's a homepage editor who takes um, the story as it's been done and that homepage editor is the person who adds all the metadata and redoes the title for web if it's, already, if it's only been done for print and that there's kind of a forked process at that point where the print subs, it, the writer's writing for everywhere, but the print subs and the online subs are doing it differently at that point. And again, that's not necessarily your system, but whatever your system is, do it the same way. Um, and then the web producer 
adds in the interactive from the devs and checks the related content and checks the metadata. And the copy editor is doing all that fun stuff that copy editors have done through time immemorial. They're ringing phone numbers, they're clicking on links, they're checking that it all works properly. And of course, they've just got more work than they ever did before. Um, in our case, we did our visualization using a product called Tableau. Um, and if you haven't heard of it, it's quite a powerful little tool. And it does have a module called Media Tableau, which relies on the media module um, and to bring in Tableau uh, into, into your stories in Drupal. Um, this is just to give you a quick image of what that looked like. And as you can see, what we ended up choosing was that we would color code whether it, whether it was exploratory or production and that the depth was size coded. So you can see that there was a, um, a deeper than 1.5 kilometer. Actually, I've zoomed in on this to show you that what we ended up discovering was there were clusters. So mapping that, visualizing that helped us understand where we then had to give those, put those stories. Um, that the cluster of, of drilling sites uh, was down near the Camden area. So that meant that MacArthur Chronicle needed that story. We saw that there was a cluster up in Central Coast, so we knew that the Central Coast Advocate needed that story. And, um, you know, at this point, you would start splitting those stories and localising them, go interview a few more people um, to make sure that works. And, of course, you call, can also, at this point, to get your front-end people to um, make this look a little prettier by checking what classes Tableau is using and making sure that it all looks gorgeous in your site. How does your editor know that it's ready to work on? Well, you need a tracking tool. Um, and again, you want your tracking tool to come into your CMS because you don't want to have to switch out. My favourite tracking tool at the moment is Harvest. Anyone here already using Harvest? A couple of people, some smiles. It's a beautiful, beautiful tool. Um, it has uh, Android and iPhone apps and desktop web and it's got a Drupal module. So what you can be doing there is uh, anytime anyone's working on a project, they hit start timer, they choose what task they're on, whether they're a dev or whether they're editorial, what they're doing. You've got a cost against them, so it tracks up how much they're spent, how much their time is worth. And when they're finished, they can complete, you can see exactly how much has been done, you can add notes, etc and it comes up into, um, into Drupal in a, in a sensible way that allows you to see where you are on each project. Um, and then the end game, which um, I'm sure there are, better, there are other ways of doing this. As I said, I'm not a dev, so maybe I'm going to throw over here again about how you guys are doing scheduling um, with, you know, once a story's in the system, how does the editor say, yep, that's ready to go live? Actually, the, uh, it's quite different with, uh, it's quite different with SCMP because they are print first and they think later. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, they actually push the paper out to the website, and then then they say we'll have that, that, and that. So by the time it gets to the website, it's already in a production format. So they'll just re repurpose it. So they don't. They'll, they'll change the web head, but they won't change the content of the story for purpose for the web. And they have a separate feed that goes out to um, the tablet. I think currently via Woodwing um, to produce that. So it's it's a little bit different. They use CCI to compose all of their content rather than you doing it inside of Drupal. We originally proposed that they do it inside of Drupal, but I think it just would have been too much of a culture shift for them to want to do that. Yeah. Multilingual, didn't you? Uh, not really. I would actually look to the browser to to provide that support. There's a lot of things that you can add into the browser to make th that kind of stuff happen. I find um, trying to do 
grammar, punctuation in Drupal, um, or even in, in the server end of things, kind of is complex because you need to submit it somehow. It needs to process and think about that and come back with recommendations. And you need to do that with a locality in mind, right? English isn't just English. It's US English or UK English. They have completely different spellings. Yeah. I mean, re revision support is easy enough. And in fact, uh, no, you can use diff module and you can see the changes between one revision to another. Um, and it's in fact, it's kind of easier. I don't know. I'm a, again, I'm not a content guy, but uh, it's easier to push the thing live because it's all about that. You know, there's also that competitive edge. You want to get that piece of news out before your competitor does. It's easier to push it if it's wrong and then correct it later than it is to go late. Because if you get that reputation of uh, being the first with the information, even if it's misspelled, um, it's, it's, uh, people will come back to you. I think, I think that's the key one. No, it never gets fixed. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, stuff.co.nz back home, that's, that's kind of them. Uh, they, they're actually owned by Fairfax Media, and they have a number of papers underneath their arm. And uh, they have this online team who will want to push current events so you know there's a house burning and so they'll just take literally take stuff off twitter and, and post it up there and stuff and it's it's wrong but as as the story unfolds it develops and it changes and it becomes better we could just go one mic <coughs> better yes just um, so this is where you could have a fast track process for the breaking news where you say, okay, the fast track doesn't go through the extensive sub-editing process and we trust that that journalist is a good enough speller and that you, you're going to miss the occasional typo, but your main process for your big articles should not be going straight live. That's a real problem from my point of view. Yeah, and and Fairfax has been teased for this mercilessly ever since they outsourced. No, I mean, look, no offense to New Zealand, but ever since they outsourced um, their sub editing to Page Masters in New Zealand, it's dropped down significantly, and it's very noticeable to anyone in the industry um, that the. And I'm sorry if anyone is here from Fairfax. I used to work for Fairfax. I love Fairfax, but unfortunately, that's true. Um, and people. I know, and people don't have time to go back and check because the next thing's happening and the next thing's happening and the next thing's happening. I think it is important to get it right first time. I think that um, spelling systems are important in this within the CMSs and that is improving, um, that built-in spell checkers and, you know, FK Editor and all those sorts of things start to have spelling within them and that people need to start using them better. Um, you know, News Limited, it's very well publicised, is moving to a big system called Method and moving away from CyberPage. Um, and up until now, you know, w when, it, when, when I talk about different tracks, the track for News Limited has been, at least for local news, you write it in CyberPage unless it's breaking news, in which case you write it into the CMS. So I am talking about an ideal situation in which you write everything in the CMS. But the... Because what was happening was a an export system from CyberPage into the CMS. Um, and the, but the, the idea of a fast track version of your process is very common. Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, it's actually, I mean, it's a complex task trying to get enable people to do the concurrent editing that Google Docs offers um, because it requires a lot of hardware and, and, th and things that Drupal is actually kind of not good at. You might have um, seen some people, there's a guy here in Sydney actually called Justin Randall who has been working with Node.js technology which is super fast and responsive and he's been working with integrating that into Drupal so that you can push something and, and pull it at the same time and interact with people in the same space and that would be the kind of place that you need to go. Um, what Google Docs have done and is pretty impressive, they also, you know, you're probably aware they also created Google Wave. In fact, that came out of Sydney and it's dead.
because it just kind of didn't, I mean, it, while it was great, you could, you know, fast forward and, and rewind and look at different parts of the document and things. No one really kind of got the idea. I think it's why it failed or maybe it was just wasn't very performant in browsers or something like that. But there's an, an incredible amount of revisioning and thought and process that needs to go into that. Uh, when you start talking about parallel uh, editing and revisioning and, and tracking who did what, it gets very complex. You think about the, the amount of metadata that needs to be associated with every single keystroke you start to really blow up the amount of data that you're storing and tracking. So I don't think that's going to ha happen in Drupal anytime soon, mainly because it's so specific that it would require a significant amount of investment, and I haven't seen anyone putting up their hand and saying, yeah, I'll, I'll fork out the dollars for that piece of development to occur. Um, so yeah, I think for now we're kind of more uh, left with revisioning. Uh, and Google wrapping around Google Docs, well, you can uh, you could you could author the content in Google Docs if you wanted to. It exports out into several different formats: HTML, uh, open document formats, and there are certainly importers that you can use to bring them into Drupal. So you could get devs to do that. Absolutely, you would be also content authoring your content in Google Docs and letting them host that data that you care about so much. Yeah. So they don't have workflow. Why, why, thank you for your timing, because that's my second note there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, th I think, look, the NPR model, I everyone's kind of amazed, and it's, an am it's, it's a huge and amazing thing. And if you are that big, then absolutely, that's what needs to happen. And as I say, News Limited's doing that with Method now, um, which is the same thing that the Chicago... Times uses one of the papers over there uses as well, and it's exactly that situation where you want to be able to put um, content, you know, design neutral content in, and it needs to be able to repur be repurposed. Um, and I I think that that is yeah it it really is what you need to be able to do, and it's just a matter of who's doing which components of it because one person can't have all of those skills necessarily. And as I said before, the way that news is handling that at the moment is that the journalists are putting in most of the content with a view to the fact that it's going into multiple areas. And then right at the very end, see what, what used to, ha so, so let's, old model, oh, this is going to be in the paper, I'm only going to do it for the paper oh, now we're taking this thing for the paper, we better put it online. Oh, it needs lots of work to change it to online. Oh, now I'm going to promote it in social. How do I do that? Oh, I need to do this, right? New model, I'm doing this all, and it's going all the way through. It's getting attached to images, it's getting attached to content, it's getting attached to metatase, it's getting attached to everything. And only right at the very end do I have, oh, I'm a print person, I'm going to pull these bits of stuff that I need from that story and put it into the layout. I'm a web person, I'm going to pull these bits of the content that's in there and put it into the layout and I need, I need the metadata, I need the short heading, I'm not going to use the long heading, I do need this kicker, I don't need that one, I do need this, I don't need that. Oh, I'm the iPad editor, I'm going to grab these bits of it. And so it's, and it's all the way through the system and it's tagged in and so anyone, it, like I said before, that someone's coming in and putting into the CMS, the photographers are not putting something into an image system over there that then has to be exported for print separately from being exported for web. They're going in and they're attaching print quality images into the CMS. The CMS automatically outputs at correct resolutions for multiple uses that the editors at the end can choose. And, you know, I think that the sort of massive content repository that the SBS people were talking about yesterday is that classic example that you need to have this huge system that takes care of all your content so that it can be used multiple times in multiple ways. Does that answer the question? Yep, good. Um, so um, this, this end game, I wasn't going to talk about paywalls because I wasn't technical. But 
I'd love to... So what my, my end game as a content person is that we then need to do social, digital and print and it's not about the technology, it's about how the message shifts in the different contexts, which I think I've now talked to, which is great. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about social into digital and single sign on open ID um, and how this functions, but I think that this is exactly where we start talking about freemium and premium. Um, because what's happening with... Does everyone know what I mean by single sign on? Yep, good. So one of the one of the things with your single sign-on systems is you instantly know a whole lot of data about people. The News Limited um, system for the Australian is a uh, freemium system where if you if you Google the article, you can get through I think five times through clicking, and then it says, "Hang on, you've read five articles for free. We're going to start charging you." Um, the New York Times I think lets you read twenty a month. Um, and these are the kinds of new systems uh, that's, and these are not using your sign-ons. It's, it, it's a different system than you sign on, but you're signing on registering so far with their own system. I don't know if there's a way of combining that with social sign-on. Yeah, I think uh, well specifically speaking to paywalls, um, you can, I mean, there's a, a, a quite a number of ways that you can make that paywall work. And I guess it's all about figuring out for your platform what's the best way to make that work? Um, and so you know, in, in the case of SCMP, they were told that they could do a metered trial sort of thing in the similar fashion to the New York Times. So they read X number of articles and they get prompted to sign on and then they, you know, that's all they get allocated for the month. Um, there have been other models as well. For example, there's the freemium idea where you actually can read the, the paper for free, um, but then there's sort of add-ons that you pay for that make it more valuable to you. And people who are really into um, a, a particular brand of, of news, they're really interested in that, they will absolutely pay for those kind of add-ons. For example, if you want to get news to your mobile device where you just pay for the app and you make money through that and things like that. And that can be kind of a, a different model. And I guess that's really more of a business level type thing, deciding how you want to uh, make those models work for you. Um, technically, the only thing I could really uh, sort of encourage you to do is not do anonymous meta trialing because it's incredibly difficult to enforce. It's, uh, you know, you put the capability to track somebody in the hands of the person you're tracking. They can just decide to drop it and pick up a new one and start from scratch again. So there's easy ways of getting around it if you're smart enough. You know, it's either that or you know, if you think that maybe 98% of your client base aren't smart enough to do it, then just don't worry about the two percent and, and and forget about it. It's the same thing with like you know, banks and credit cards. You know, they know that credit card fraud is huge, but they you know they just pay it back anyway because it's worth having credit cards around. So uh, that that I think is the, you know best advice. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So they do that. And I guess for the most part, it's like the number's so high that you don't actually care at the beginning about getting rid of it. And then you start using the 20 and you know, 20 down the track, you kind of really enjoy the experience. And maybe you start to feel a bit guilty. Like, oh, actually, I should perhaps pay instead of wiping my cookies and, and, and starting from scratch again. Yeah. Um, can I just point out that, and I, I probably am not allowed to say the numbers, but New York Times and the Australian and News Local's experiences, I think, are pretty similar. And New York Times has spoken about this in, in public a little bit, that despite the millions and millions and millions of page views per month, the number of people who actually come back on a regular basis is very small, I, I proportionally. And you don't need to worry too much about the techie people who are going to clear their caches because they're not necessarily your absolutely regular readers anyway. And the absolutely regular readers who pay can... The price points have been set in such a way that they should make it work because what you're doing is saying, I don't mind giving away one article every six months to that to this huge number of people, but they're only going to look at one article every six months. What I'm trying to do is say, I, you, the, those, you know, 
10 out of 100 people or whatever it is, you rely on us. You can't survive in your business day without us, so you're prepared to pay. The other one too is, just before your question, uh, is that you, uh, when you are tracking someone for how many views they can have, you can only track them on the device. And I don't mean the physical device, I mean on the software device that you're using. So, you know, every, inter every web browser that you've got installed has its own limit. Then you can switch to your phone, then to your tablet, and they have different browsers as well. Then you've got your work computer. So, so you know, even though you might only get you know, 20 articles a month in, in New York Times, well, you can bust through that in a week on one device and then switch. So it, it really doesn't work unless you can ask people to invest in the meter, as in put your username and password in, and you can only get access to the meter through a username and password. Then you can track on, the s on your server how many views they've had, and you can enforce that across the device. But news agencies don't want people to do that because they'll just leave. And they think that that's important. It's also probably worth also uh, considering there are, there are uh, news companies out there that have a complete paywall block, and you can't see anything without signing in. And they have a very small number of users, but they all pay a subscription fee, and they make just as much money as people who implement meter trial. So you need to understand that the kind of users that you have, you know, are they kind of one hit time and they go away and they never come back, or maybe premium is better, or if they are, you know, constant users, or you, you know, you, uh, you can't sort of say here's a one size thing that fits everyone because you need to understand your traffic before you start making decisions on how those should work. There's, there's also kind of almost a system called a Noemium, which is um, <laughs> which is the crikey model, where you can sign in for free and then they send you emails constantly telling you that you are, you know, a lazy bum who is stealing from them and you should really pay. And they, then they start s saying to you, you know, hi, you know, um, sorry? Hi, you know, hi squatter, you know, is how the email starts. How are you doing today? You know, so, um, look, I want to, I, I will, we've, we've got uh, sort of 10 minutes left and I want to quickly touch on a couple of other things and then come back to questions. Um, so, one of the things was about um, tagging and taxonomies and how they can feed into social. Everything in our system was automatically tagged and that meant it could be then fed into Yahoo Pipes. Is any everyone aware of Yahoo Pipes? So you can then feed that into Yahoo Pipes, which then feeds into Twitter feeds, which then feeds into Twitter and other R and, and anywhere else that you can stick an RSS feed. So, for example, the story, the fracking story I was talking about before would have been tagged with Environment, Council, MacArthur, uh, Central Coast, in a west because of the Petersham Tower, uh, not Petersham, St. Peter's Tower, and then automatically picked up by those Yahoo pipes, automatically fed out into Twitter. So um, the, when you're doing taxonomies, you're not just thinking about how does this work on the website. You also should be thinking about how does this feed into the social systems that are out there and the kind of ecology, the bio system that you've created for your, your brand. Um, and... We also uh, measured and uh, rated all of our journalists on their social media sharing. So in addition to it going out auto automatically, Ty would have been doing it as the old fashioned way of cutting and pasting into his uh, Twitter feed personally. Um, and then, and here's where we're doing it backwards to South China Morning Post, but it has, I think, a, a huge benefit is that it comes around in this virtuous circle, is that you then can put on the side of an article all of these quotes because you've put it onto Twitter or Facebook and you've said, hey, everyone, what do you think of the map? Go look at the map and comment on it. They then comment on it. You then pull those comments in as if you've done Vox Pops and you don't have to go stand in Pitt Street Mall or Burke Street Mall with a camera and a journalist for five hours in the heat or the rain until you get enough people who've said the right things to you. Right? Now, if you're News Limited, you also have a rule that they have to tell you what suburb they're living in. So once you've chosen which suburb, which stories you're going to do, you need to choose, check that they're real people. You just send them messages through Facebook from your personal journalist account and get their permission to put it in the paper. But you have also should be sensible and have a terms of a house rules on your Facebook site and on anywhere else that says if you comment on our page, you are giving us permission to publish. On, yeah. <coughs> well, you're giving us permission to publish in print though. You know, it's already because a lot of people don't realise that and then they get a bit freaked out by it. Um, and, of course, you know, there's 
more online. Down here you can see there's a little thing that says, do you support or oppose these new restrictions? Comment online. So you're then switching people back from the print to the online and that's keeping, on the, keeping the circle going. Um, there are polls and surveys. There's all those kinds of things that you can use. And I want to... So what I, one of the reasons I really wanted to get to, to this end bit is one of the things we've been talking about here is about collaborating between dev and content. And we always talk about agile when we're talking about dev. But we never talk about agile when we're talking about content. We seem to have this idea that we went to journalism school, we learned how to do it, and then we're done. And it's just not true. You can't shoehorn the old ways of doing content into the new world. You have to adapt what you're doing. And you have to adapt it on a regular basis. And I think that what I want to start seeing is cross-functional teams where you have a stand-up meeting with editorial and production and management where everyone talks together about what they're up to and how they're working on it and what their challenges are so that everybody's understanding their own their positions together. At News, we had a weekly phone hookup with all of the teams talking about what our challenges were with online. The sprints were still dev sprints every six weeks and everything that was new was then presented back to the editorial teams so the editorial teams could understand the new dimensions of what we could achieve. And I think that's really um, a very important thing. You're also talking about devices and that's where your analytics are informing your content strategy because it's not something you do once. Um, I've, I've cheated a little and stuck in a user persona slide right at the end because people think this is something you do at the beginning when you're doing a big redevelopment and then you do it and you don't do it again or you do it when you're first starting this website that you guys are doing because you've got a print product and doing it for the first time. But I think user personas are something you come back to all the time. Who are your readers? How are they reading? Do they dip in and out? Are they head what, what News Limited called headline sniffers, where they come along and they scan for the headlines and they go away again? Are they leisure readers? Do they wait for the weekend and read for two hours at a time? If that changes, you need to change your content and how you're delivering and when you're delivering. After Christmas 2011, we noticed something very interesting in January 2012. All of a sudden, people started reading the news half an hour earlier and we suddenly had a peak at 9 o'clock at night on a new screen size. iPads. Everyone got them for Christmas and all of a sudden, the mums and dads were waiting till the kids were in bed and reading the news on their iPads. That changes your content delivery also should end up having you go back to your dev team and say, hey, we need to make sure we're optimising our interactives for iPad because that's now our key evening audience. So we're delivering our breaking news headline sniffers for mobile phones. They're reading them at 8.30 in the morning on the train. Then they're reading on their desktops at lunchtime. Then they're reading on their iPads at 9 o'clock. How do we make sure that we're delivering the right content at the right time in the right ways for those audiences? And uh, that's me done. Uh, and that's we've got we just said we had questions on this slide, right? That's the five minutes for questions. There's right? another question over here. Yep. Open Calais. Yep. I can I can I can expand on that a little bit. Yeah, so there's an open KLA module. If you install it, it comes in two parts. There's the API module and then the actual module itself. Uh, using the actual module itself, you know, it enables the API module and you take a piece of content. It'll firstly it'll create a uh, vo a set of vo vocabularies that align with what how open KLA categorizes things. And you send the article across, it sends it back and it tells you here are all the terms for each vocabulary and it creates the terms for you if they don't exist previously and things like that. Uh, and, and then it'll, it'll associate and tag it all. You need to kind of configure it a little bit though because it can go over the top quite easily. You can send an article away and uh, it might be something like, okay, let's, let's take the scenario where Michael Jackson died and there was, a, um, yeah, there was the fault was being blamed on the doctor. 
So then that'll go into all kinds of things. There'll be some cool things, like it'll come back with Michael Jackson and it'll come back with medical science or something. You're like, yeah, well, that's kind of medical and, you know, that's irrelevant. And then it'll it'll just go, you know, and go way too far. Like, oh, I saw the colour green, so that's there. And, uh, you know, there's a, a country over here and, uh, and like, start putting it, you know, really uh, quite detailed. Now, that you might want that stuff if you, that's how you're sort of um, doing things. When we had uh, 800,000 articles and you get back, say, 30 terms to a single article, that becomes a technical problem because 30 times 800,000 is a lot of data to store. So we didn't want to go down that, that path and, and have to deal with that much data, so we wanted to reduce that. It also meant that like you have incredibly huge topic pages. You click on that topic and you get lists, and some will just have two articles in them, and some will have 10, and some will have a lot, a, a lot different. So you know, articles that only have two, well, that's not really a valid page on your website. Let's get rid of that. So you have to also think about other things like logic for reducing how much topics come in. Yeah. They actually sends back a relevant scoring for each term. It also there's um back. You can it's a quote yeah. Yeah, it used to be this thing back in the early two thousands called a tag cloud, and you know it was like bigger tags and yeah you know, you're cool if you embed one of those on the side of your website. That doesn't happen anymore. So from behind the paywall, the sharing, sharing behind the paywall, strategies to combat it or to encourage it? Right. Uh, yeah. So do you want to yeah, I'm just going to review what you do. Yeah. No, um, all I, I know that there was a lot of discussion at The Australian about that to before they introduced the paywall, about whether you were going to be able to get through the five freemium from shared as well as from Google. And that's where some of the discussion about how much uh, the, how much information was going to be shown before uh, you logged in, and that's why you can see three paragraphs for free. I also think uh, sometimes I, I see like news media companies coming on board, and they realise that the end user expects to see ads whether they're logged in or they're a subscriber, you know, or not, which is kind of funny because you know you, that is a revenue stream for you. So you know you could actually decide to just let your site be free access. Here's all of our content. Go ahead and see it. You'd get so many hits. You know you get all that, and you'd get revenue from advertising. So you're shaking your head because that doesn't happen, right? But because yeah. Because way back in the 90s, this was worked out that if a site is paying for online advertising and never is seeking any contributors to social, they weren't. They didn't have enough foresight to see that print was going to be dead. And they didn't think that their classified revenue was going to go into the toilet, and therefore they just went, oh, don't worry, we'll just charge you a tiny amount for a thousand views. Oh, damn, we've just signed our investment. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, crazily enough, though, like, there are certain ads that you'll allow on your sites that users don't like. Things like videos that play, autoplay. I mean, that's one of the ones that uh, is a pet peeve of mine because, you know, if he's, I just wanted to read your article. I don't want you to take my bandwidth to play a video I don't, I'm not interested in. And yet, you pay for a subscription, and you still see that same ad show up. It's like, hmm. Yeah. Right, but if you if you're ad blocking, right, well then you, then you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot because if they're not getting the impression, then they're not getting the money, and they're not continuing continuing the product that you enjoy. Unfortunately. Yeah. Why what? It's, yeah, it's kind of my point. So you should. Uh, so you're saying you should pay for a subscription and implement an ad blocker. You shouldn't have to, right? <laughs> yeah, but behind the paywall, there's still advertising, as as you're saying, and and you're trying to find a way that you can encourage that.
Um, there's actually, I'm trying to rate my brain about what they are, but there was, I remember, because I was at the um, Asia Media Conference in December, and they spoke of three different types of people that you have coming into your site. You've got the, the mass crowd that come by and they're sort of quick hits. They, they look at your site, they get what they can from it, they go away and they don't really come back. For most people, that's a huge amount. Then you have uh, people who buy into your subscriptions and they make you some money. And then there's uh, people who buy extensions onto that and you know fully get into the whole thing. And there's these, there's these three areas you need to look at how how big each one of these areas are and then strategize towards that model. So that's, yeah, from my experience, what you need. I, I think that what we're going to start to see is a similar system to the app models where there is actually going to be two levels of paid. Um, and so you're going to have the, the free model and then you're going to have the the minimum subscription where you get X amount per month but you still have to put up with ads and then there's kind of a, a super premium preferred customer version where you get you know untrammeled access and no ads and the ones who really really want that will pay that um, you we've already seen with the Australian Financial Review that you know the online version of that is a thousand five hundred dollars a year to subscribe you know that's unheard of no one thought it would succeed but You mean like the SMH iPad app and Yeah, yeah. So we were both talking before about Woodwing and Woodwing is something that just sort of takes materials out of um, InDesign and other Adobe products and turns it into apps and there's you know, there's certain amounts of things you can do with that. Um, I think that um, the app the magazines that I've been seeing done with oomph and the pricing structure with oomph makes that work. And I don't know how that works in with everything else you guys are doing, but do you know about oomph? And I don't know about oomph. I'm just trying to think about what I can add to that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, from a, from a technical perspective, implementing a paywall across all your devices is a challenge. Uh, and so they do try and build, I think you'll naturally find that people end up bundling stuff like iPad and videos and things in naturally because it's like either you have it or you don't have it because it's too hard implementing it in incremental bits. Um, but yeah, I think this sort of ends up happening that way. And I don't know whether the, the sort of public have kind of clued onto that or do they kind of think, oh, extra stuff, I'll buy it. 